speaker is uh, Professor Karim Redia. The role of universities is a Michigan State. Yes, right. Yeah, you can say more about what you think is the problem. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Diana and Daniel Karanja and Andrew and others for including Michigan State University in these side events for the last two or three years now. So it's really honored to be back. Uh, I really admire the energy that Diana has put in. You know, we, Professor Ambali and I were we Lansing in the restaurant on Saturday and Sunday and we talked to her and in the evening and she's very committed and we're really thankful for her, her, her work here. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, what I'm presenting is, uh, is, a, is a teamwork. It's not work just done by myself. Team at Michigan State and also our team in Africa. Uh, here we have with us Professor Rafi Ambali here and also the director of the program, Dr. Jeremy Budrag, who is here. He's based are they in stand up, the ones who are your team? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. And then also, and so people can see Rashini, you, they can ask for your cards later. Dr. Rashini Gali yeah. from there from yes. Michigan State and Dr. Yeah. Ruth. Uh, and yes. we also have one of the board of fellow from Ethiopia who is okay. at Michigan State right okay. now. Well, yes. There, Dr. Teklu and okay. Dr. Nanda Joshi here. Okay. And of course, our dean is here, of course, right? Uh, yeah. Dean Hansen, right? Yeah. Okay. And many others from the uh, Alliance for African Partnership Farm. And yes, thank you. So uh, I think Madam told us that we are free to say anything we want, right? <laughs> <laughs> Showing my slides, I just want to tell a little bit about myself uh, because there are a lot of young people here. Yeah. So I'm originally from India. I was born in a small village of about 2,500 people, and I was born at home. There were no hospitals. There were no clinic in my village. Home was the hospital. Home was the hospital. <laughs> and my I, my parents were farmers, dairy farmers, and our day started with my mother milking buffalo. We prefer buffalo milk over cow milk in India. Mm -hmm. Buffalo milk has 8% fat. So everybody likes fat, milk with more fat. <laughs> uh, but that's how, if the buffaloes didn't give the milk, we didn't have the breakfast, we didn't have the tea. You know. So life was tough. Anyway, I uh, did my undergraduate degree in India. And I, if Madam, you mentioned that the United States has done a lot, lot of good things for the world. And I'm one, one of the good examples. I came to the United States and I did my master's and PhD degree in the U.S. So when I was a student in my PhD degree in our college of agriculture, we were five students from India. After the first semester, four of them changed their major to computer science. I'm the only one I didn't say, but I said, I'm going to stick to agriculture. And the reason they changed their major to computer science was because that they were saying, oh, there are lots of jobs in computer science and I'm going to get my green card and citizenship. <laughs> in agriculture, jobs were you know, easy to find, but I stick to there and I finished my PhD. I went back home. I wanted to work in India. And I went to India. You know, India has lots of trained people, right? Not easy to find job. So I said, can I open up myself to the whole world? And I started applying and I got a job at Simic, Mexico. The home of Green Revolution. Uh, so I arrived in Mexico with not a word of Spanish, not even gracias, you know, I didn't know. So here I left and the civil driver picks me up at the airport, takes me to the campus and, you know, when you arrive there at a new institution, they put you in a guest house with a one bedroom apartment or so. And when I entered there, I saw my name there and I saw a name my name with say Dr. Borla, Dr. Borla. And first I thought, am I in the wrong place? How could I be in a place where Dr. Borla is staying? Because you know, I'm a noble lawyer. Anyway, it was a great experience at Summit. Dr. Borla was retired, but he was there. He ate in the same cafeteria that we ate. He stood in the same line of you know cafeteria that we were. When the reporters came to interview him, many times he came to the field, he held our hands and asked reporters to speak to us, not to him, you know. So it was great. Uh, and then I uh, 
it was a three-year contract job at Cement, and I came to Michigan State University. And it changed my entire life. Because Mich what Michigan State has really provided me and many others is that enabling environment that Professor Ambali spoke. That the flexibility, the support, the commitment. And so what I'm presenting is my work at, at, at Michigan State University uh, working with African Union Nepal. So that's sort of my story, and I feel like you know one can help their country by being physically there, or you can help your country by staying away, but really being protected. And this is what exactly what I have done, and I really uh, feel very grateful for that. Uh, so my presentation is, uh, I think, uh, uh, Diana asked me to talk about what is the role of universities like Michigan State University in, 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 in building these partnerships that Tom Jane and others have discussed. Uh, so I'm just going to give a case study of example of our partnership with African Union, uh, Nepal. Uh, so a little bit about Michigan State University. We are a public university. We are a land grant university. Our mission is very uh, simple, advancing knowledge transforming lives, right? As a university, we are generating new knowledge, but whatever we generate, we want to make sure that it impacts the lives of the people. People not only in Michigan or in the United States, but all over the world. And our mission, a three-fold mission, as a land grant, uh, university, research, teaching, extension, and outreach. It's the outreach mission that goes beyond the boundaries of Michigan and the United States to all over the world. So. Our president now refers to us as not just land grant university, but world grant university, or the global grant university. Mm -hmm. And we are really proud of that, with that vision. Uh, uh, I'm uh, part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources at Michigan State University, which is one of the 15 colleges on campus. We are a comprehensive university. We were founded as a College of Agriculture, but now we have many disciplines. And College of Agriculture and Natural Resources has international programs uh, spanning many different areas, everything from natural resource management to food and nutritional security, harnessing science and technology, uh, looping and technology transfer, education, training, <coughs> capacity building, social sciences, and so on. So the World Technology Access Program, World Tech, that I serve as a director, is part of the, our College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And our uh, mission, our goal is, is, uh, is really to facilitate uh, knowledge, information, technology exchanges through training, networking, and capacity building. So we organize many short courses, workshops, internships, study tools, uh, facilitate technology transfer, and our programs are not only just done at Michigan State, but we also take our programs in international settings uh, all over the world. Uh, it, I think we have all been talking about biotechnology and, and investments in biotechnology. I think if we really look at last a decade or last couple of decades, international development agencies, national governments, and many others, private sector, they have invested more than $100 million. If you really count, more than $100 million have been invested in biotechnology research and development. Uh, and these groups are working with a number of different crops, and it's ranging from you know, crops like cotton, which are commercial <coughs> crop, to food security crops like maize, cassava, bananas, cowpea, sorghum, sweet potato, rice, potato, we just heard about potato, uh, sweet potato, to modern biotechnology. And these uh, programs are addressing some of the key constraints that we have not been able to solve through conventional means, like insect and disease resistance, drought tolerance, nutritional enhancement, and, and other, uh, other stresses. I think we all are aware of there are many challenges to taking biotech crops from laboratory to smallholder farmers, right? Many challenges. But one of the key challenge is the lack of functional biosafety regulatory system. Uh, I think we talked, somebody asked that question there. Uh, and this is what, uh, under the NAPART MSU partnership, this is what we are really focusing on building capacity on uh, biosafety regulatory systems. Uh, 
the Nepal MSU partnership on in this ABNE program, really uh, the basis of that is from the recommendation of the African Union Nepal uh, high level panel on modern biotechnology. Uh, and this, these recommendations are in this publication called Freedom to Innovate. I have a copy with me. Uh, one can also get an electronic copy. Uh, it's available if anybody wants. I'll be happy to uh, email it to you. Uh, but please look at this. Uh, this was a high level panel appointed by African Union Nepal. Professor Ambali actually his office served as a secretary and there were 14 members. That was This panel was led by Professor Salisus Juma, and, uh, uh, who is at Harvard now, <coughs> and, uh, originally from Kenya, and uh, uh, Professor Ismail Saragandi from Egypt. Uh, and then there were 12 other members there. Yeah. Uh, but basically, what this, one of the key recommendations of this panel that science and regulation should go uh, If we just have regulations and no technology and no science, what, what good are they? It's not going to go anywhere. Uh, if, we, if we just have uh, regulations but no technology, what good, is, what good are the regulations? So they must go anywhere. And I think this is what really formed the basis of, of our partnership there. And really we are focusing on empowering African policymakers and this freedom to innovate, uh, these recommendations focused on how do we empower, how do we build the capacity of African policymakers and regulators for safe and responsible access, use and management of biotech crops and their products. Uh, so this is what formed the ABNE, the African Biosafety Network of Expertise, and uh, we are really uh, uh, focusing on empowering regulators and policymakers. Uh, and uh, our our focus is on on modern biotechnology uh, to start with on GMOs. Uh, the Nepal MSU partnership was initiated in 2007. Uh, uh, there was an MOU signed between Michigan State University uh, and uh, Nepal agency, uh, and, and which was facilitated by, by, by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Martha Cho from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation there. Uh, Professor Ibrahim Bayarki, the CEO of Nepal agency, and Dr. Frank Fier, the <coughs> senior associate dean. Uh, so the ABNE network was launched in 2009. Uh, we have currently on the, we have presence on the ground. Uh, we have three nodes. Uh, the first node was launched in 2009 in Bangladesh, Burkina Faso. The second one in Kampala, Uganda, and the third node was launched this year in Dakar, Senegal. And Dr. Jeremy Budra, who is the director of the network. Is based in Dakar, and we have a team of 16 experts, all African experts, specialists, uh, and they are based at these three nodes. Uh, we are focusing on 12 countries. There are 54 member countries of uh, AU. We can't. We don't have resources to work with all 54, but we are focusing on 12 countries right now. And uh, the role of Michigan State University is we are international partner of ABNE network and really our goal is to provide technical support, technical expertise to the team. And we don't do this work alone. We work with a number of other service providers and also partners around the world. Uh, so the ABNE Biosafety Service Network, we are uh, offering services to regulators and policy makers. We provide information, we provide technical assistance, training, we provide network opportunity, and also we are engaged in policy advocacy. The key areas of our focus is on the environmental safety, food safety, uh, legal issues. Uh, countries are writing their regulations, their guidelines, uh, and so on. Socioeconomic issues, of course, we want uh, this new modern biotechnology uh, meet the socioeconomic needs, uh, and then also the communication and outreach. Uh, and through the through links with Michigan State University, the ABNE network harnesses biosafety resources and expertise from all over. Here is one example: we organize our annual uh, agriculture biotechnology and biosafety short course, and 
we host a number of African regulators and policy makers uh, in this program. We also organized uh, study tours. Uh, this was done in January. We had 12 African leaders, regulators, and policy makers come to the study tour in India. They met with the regulators in India, and also visited several companies, seed companies in India. And here is one example. There in the BT cotton field in India, in Hyderabad. And by the way, through this program, a, a linkage has been developed with Ethiopia. And now Ethiopia has, is testing this crop this season. Uh, we are also working uh, with partnering with African University to offer these training programs in Africa. This is a program done uh, in collaboration with the University of Ghana in Lagos. Here, Professor Eric Denkwa is here. And uh, we launched uh, a biosafety course at the University of Ghana last year in July 2015. Our dean, Steve Hansen, was there. See, the dean was there in Africa. Yeah? <laughs> so that was really nice. Now, uh, for more information on ABNE Network, uh, please visit the website there. Uh, by the way, we don't do this work alone. We partner with a number of organizations, USAID program on biosafety system, USDA Foreign Agriculture Service has been a great supporter for training and capacity building. We work with the government agencies, non-profit organizations, Danforth Center. We also work with European organizations like Ghent University, IPBO, uh, African universities, private sector, and others. Uh, now, uh, the needs and demand for our services are growing, so we are scaling up the expertise. Uh, and we have launched five resource networks, because we only have 15 people uh, out there, eight of them are technical experts and so on. We need to really scale up our expertise base. So we have launched five resource networks in each of our focus areas. Uh, here is a photo, ma'am. This is a photo of our network of lawyers. Uh, uh, we have 28 African lawyers now in the network. Uh, the network is led by a, a lawyer from Uganda. Uh, here is part of our ABNE team, uh, Kile Sande. And also Michigan State University is part of this. Here is Ruth there. See Ruth from Uganda? Mm -hmm. She's there. Uh, so we brought Ruth from Africa to in to MSU, but for Africa, yeah? yeah. So she's really working very well. Uh, we also participate in high-level policy advocacy that Nepal agency, particularly Professor Ambani's office, facilitates. So where appropriate, we be a part of that. Here is the policy advocacy activity in Mozambique. Mm. This May here. We met with the Minister of Science and Technology. And it's great to really sit down with the minister face to face mm -hmm. and, uh, and facilitate this. We are also, uh, uh, whatever the work we have done, we also do mm -hmm. joint publications. Here is a book we have brought out uh, with ABNE, with our colleagues at uh, Nepal on biosafety in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and every two or three years we will update this book. So, what are the impacts? Uh, we really, uh, I think. Through the services that ABNE Network is providing, we are really, uh, countries are, are putting together workable and harmonized policies and regulations so that the safe biotech crops can reach to small borders. Uh -huh. And decisions are made on applications for confined field trial and general releases. This year alone, three countries, three new countries, have made decisions on the confined field trial and the crops are in the field there. Uh, there are two countries that have made decisions on general releases and more are coming. So, I think there is a wind of change. I think there are a lot of positive things are developing. So, I think for Simplot, uh, you know, some of these regulatory uh, capacity building efforts uh, will pave way for your, for your potatoes. Uh, so, in summary, the role of uh, Michigan State University as an international partner, we are involved in education, training, experiential learning, technical assistance, networking opportunity, particularly supporting South-South collaboration, uh, information access, uh, curriculum enhancement at universities through training of trainer programs, uh, collaborative research, uh, outreach to various stakeholders, and also facilitating access to technology from other countries. 
and lastly was the resource mobilization. So I want to end with a quote from uh, Professor Thomas Odiambo. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was the yeah. founder and the director of the ICP, the International Center for Insect Physiology and Ecology in Nairobi, Kenya, and also founding president of African Academy of Science. I had a privilege to meet him uh, at ICP uh, in 1988 when I was working for CIMIT. CIMIT sent me to Kenya, and the first person I met was Professor Odiambo. And I think one of his core, his vision was really to develop the, the indigenous capacity so that, uh, they, that we can address that Africa's, uh, their own resources who can mobilize, uh, uh, you know, this and, and really bring the change that we are all looking for. So uh, thank you. Uh, we want to thank Nepal and the African Union uh, for all their support. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, Mr. Lawrence Kent was here today, our program officer. I don't know if he's still here, but a great support. It's really a, and a very long term support because uh, they've been funding our work since 2007. Uh, so it's really nice to have a, and of course, Michigan State University, my home institution, and the governments and collaborators in Africa, and, and all of our international collaborators. So thank you very much. Thank you.